and good morning, almost afternoon, or maybe afternoon for some folks, maybe morning for others. Welcome to our 2022 Grain Growers Series hosted by the Northern Grain Growers Association and also the University of Vermont Extension. Well, we of course want to thank our funders as well, Northeast SARE and the USDA Department of Agriculture, NIFA, for their support in our research and outreach in grain growing. And today we're going to be talking about ecological rye production with Sandy Seiberg of White Oak Farm in Wisconsin. And I had the pleasure of meeting Sandy, which one was that? December? January. I don't remember, Sandy. We um, served on a, a panel together with Todd Hardy, who's the president of the Northern Grain Growers Association, and myself in a NOFA New York webinar, and just really enjoyed hearing about Sandy's farm and his work um, with growing grains, especially rye, but others too. And uh, his approach to farming, which was exciting and refreshing. And uh, it was just really great to meet him. And then the first thing I thought was, oh, will you come speak <laughs> at our Grain Grower Series? Um, and and he agreed. So we we dug him out of the mud this morning, <laughs> trying to hunt him down during mud season to make sure he was joining us. And we're so happy that you did, Sandy. And we know you're busy, so we'll get to it and um, appreciate your time today. Yeah, great. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, uh, really, really pleased and humbled to to join. Um, you know, a, a group of fellow grain growers and, and researchers, um, you know, my history, uh, and I'll get into it a little bit further with some slides, but <clears throat> it really has been, um, you know, uh, growing up on a farm, you know, that never transitioned to conventional. Um, so, you know, my organic ethos was really embedded in me, you know, by my grandfather who had chosen uh, just, you know, not to either believe or follow um, you know, the fertilizer salesman in the 40s. And, uh, you know, a lot of that has grown from there. You know, I, I uh, was responsible for making compost on the farm, started when I was eight, mainly because I wanted to be able to kick my brother, who was 12, out of the truck that went out and collected leaves. Um, you know, what kid, what 12, 10 or 12 year old kid doesn't want to be able to drive a pickup truck on the road. Um, and that led into a life of, you know, really following and pursuing, you know, composting and soil health started a composting business here in Wisconsin that grew, you know, over 20 plus years to about 100,000 tons of compost, um, has both a regional and a national retail and agricultural brands. Um, uh, that afforded me the opportunity to travel uh, around this country, around the world actually, and visit, um, boy, you know, thousands of farms. And that's probably where, you know, the majority of my education, um, because I didn't go to secondary education. Um, as I was joking with Heather earlier, I probably barely made it out of high school, right? Um, that's what happens when you let a 10 year old drive a pickup truck on the road. So, you know, it gets a little wild, but uh, anyhow, that, you know, that, that learning from other farmers and these types of environments where, you know, there are other people that are either passionate users, passionate growers, wannabe growers, first generation, fifth generation. You know, I've never uh, been particularly I always call myself sort of either a first generation or a third generation farmer, you know, it sort of skipped it. My dad didn't farm. Um, my dad was a, an engineer and a manufacturer. Um, you know, it, both my grandfathers were serial entrepreneurs. So, you know, there was a period of time that I looked away from the farm, you know, and the farm called me back. Um, so anyhow, you know, that's, that's a bit of my passion, my history. I think it's really important that I sort of run through some of the things that, um, as Heather indicated, you know, might might be experiences that, that I have on my own farm or that I've learned from other farmers, you know, that might be thought provoking or, or nuggets of information that, that might be helpful. Rye has become a significant passion of mine for a number of reasons, um, from climate change, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico to human and animal nutrition, you know, to the fact that it's just been a significant tool in my toolbox over the years of not only maintaining soil health, fertility, and productivity on, on my organic acres. But, you know, it's been really important as a component of, of uh, allowing me, you know, a tool allowing me to, to transition 
you know, acres to organic as well. So um, just getting on that, that rye lane, putting my rye goggles on, you know, has been, been, been important over the years. So yeah, Seaburg Farm actually purchased uh, in 1896, didn't move on until 1904. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some of those acres that, that, uh, that I'm still farming today. And that, and that, and to that point, you know, the, so those acres never received a synthetic fertilizer or a, a um, herbicide, pesticide, you know, uh, GMO seed. Yeah, so, you know, the again, not, not really getting too heavily focused. I really feel it's important that, you know, with the loss of the number of farmers in the country that we encourage young and old to be first generation farmers. So I don't put a lot of stock personally in, um, in, in, you know, the multi-generational aspects uh, of farming beyond the benefit that they, that they provide for families and communities. It's important, but, but at some point in time, it can also, I think, feel somewhat exclusive to people that might look to enter agriculture. So, you know, trying to really embrace anybody that wants to farm because, you know, we're, we need, we need more farmers, right? The, the, the age of farmers uh, in this country and the quantity of them, the consolidation is something that is also important that in, in the work that I can and hopefully do, you know, um, will at least make a small dent in, in, in reversing that trend. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're currently at about 700 certified organic acres. We've been running 400 for decades. Um, local private foundation land trust is looking to have a couple thousand acres transition to organic. Um, Included in that is 250 acres of organic pasture where we currently have the grass fed beef that I was up to my shins and mud this morning with. And, and it looks like, uh, you know, the dairy markets might open up and we'll be able to restart that parlor and, and start milking some cows there. Pretty diverse crop rotation. Um, you know, uh, have a great relationship with Albert Lee Seed where I've been growing seed for them, you know, of, a, of different varieties with the exception of corn. I don't do any corn seed production, but Barley's, rice, uh, buckwheats, and peas, uh, and vetch, you know, um, are pretty commonly grown on our acres uh, to allow us to help to diversify that rotation. And it's, it's, it, it also helps that they still maintain, you know, a foot in the marketplace, you know, for, for uh, you know, conventional untreated and even conventional seed. So, so it's, been, it's been a great opportunity to be able to take some of those transition acres and grow a crop. Um, which, which they'll buy as a, and, and be in a position to sell as a conventional seed, you know, knowing later, you know, they're going to get seed production from those certified organic acres. So, you know, a lot of the, the work that I've done, you know, is to try and manage weeds. This is sort of a, a really quick overview, confusing slide, you know, of, of what, um, you know, our rotation may look like it's really more of a sequence. It doesn't always fall in, in numerical order like this, but uh, the, the two strong components are, you know, uh, not following a heavy feeding crop like corn, uh, you know, with another heavy feeding crop and not following a row crop with a row crop. So we always sort of alternate between, um, you know, crops like rye or barley that will go out and, and uh, capture nutrients, you know, from a previous year's crop, go to a solid seeded, and more importantly, those planting and harvesting dates vary so much that, you know, that that's really more importantly, sort of the weed management strategy, uh, because we never get, you know, annual or, you know, uh, perennial, even winter annual, you know, win winter annual weeds that really have an opportunity to take uh, sort of a toehold, you know, versus a really tight rotation as a conventional alternation, actually, you know, as shown in the bottom there with just a corn and soy alternation. These have been really instrumental books that I've read. I'm sure all of us have, you know, our favorite reading list, um, you know, but Albrecht's work, uh, which has been simplified and, and more easily digested in Gary Zimmer's book, you know, are, are you know, the, the pages are dog-eared, you know, there's highlighter and notes in the margins you know, of, of all those books, I, I recommend that, that uh, if you haven't read some or all of them, you know, that you, that you do, because it's, it's really been helpful in my understanding of, um, you know, nutrient components, you know, which then support plant health, which then obviously support animal and, and human health. You know, the calcium piece, um, 
which was Albrecht's cornerstone, um, you know, is is one of the things that's been tried and true. Seen it um, on my own farm and around the country, you know, and and it, all of the things that it's required for, <clears throat> you know, from the standpoint of, uh, I think you know Gary calls it the trucker of all nutrients, right? You know, it's gonna it's gonna move those things. So so in some of our fields that we've been on, you know, because calcium hasn't been addressed, other than potentially trying to offset you know, the high nitrogen fertilizer uses, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers that have been acidifying soils. They've been looking at it from a pH standpoint, not necessarily from an available calcium standpoint. According to Albrecht and in my own experience and in my, my you know, consulting and helping farmers uh, around the country, around the world, you know, it's always been evident that when we get into these low calcium soil situations, you know, that we see weed problems. You know, so this is a field <clears throat> that, uh, was just going into its its uh, first year of organic corn was really low in base saturation of calcium and you could see the weeds that we were fighting there. Um, you know, we went to, uh, you know, a rye crop, which we took off and then um, did some calcium soil correctives, you know, with some high cal lime and, uh, and, you know, harvested that rye, frost seeded clover and then came back, um, Oh, and it's not advancing. Sorry. Um, no worries. Next. Maybe I got to do that. Hmm. No, well, it advanced the last time I asked it to. Yeah. There we go. There you go. Might just so, be a delay. So, you know, that's that's the second effort at organic corn in the very same field. Um, after doing significant, you know, calcium calcium corrections. You know, these are the fields, um, the field across the road on the left, uh, which we don't farm, um, you know, was not uh, addressed with calcium. And you can see the increase in water infiltration and flocculation of the soil by getting those calcium levels up. Um, you know, just, just really important to be looking at. I found that anyhow in organic that, you know, getting the soil right, you know, makes some of the other things relative to the challenges of organic, you know, just much simpler, much, much less of an uphill battle. We did a, uh, on the farm, we did a quick, uh, and this was with barley, but it, you know, I think it's very transferable to, to uh, any small grain, rye in particular is what we're talking about. But, you know, we, we, we used a, a locally produced, highly soluble organic uh, form of calcium, only put 500 pounds on, uh, you know, right after planting the barley in the spring. And you can see that um, you know, even in areas where the farmer doesn't normally myself uh, advertise that I skip in a field, like on the picture on the left, you know, the barley's up and we just don't see any any weeds coming. You know, especially some of the problematic weeds, uh, you know, like fox foxtail. You know, just get shut off by you know their their trigger mechanism to germinate is in is to you know germinate in low calcium soils you know, deep roots, mine some calcium, you know, and that's nature's way of, you know, of trying to correct that calcium deficiency. But if we, you know, mimic that high calcium, even in, it, just at the very surface of the soil where those weed seeds wanted to germinate, we can see suppression of, uh, of those weeds. That's that same skip at, you know, a couple of weeks before harvest time. Um, and then we did leave a strip in the field where we didn't put any high cal lime out and after harvest, you can see right what was laying underneath, um, you know, all that barley come harvest time. So, again, back to Albrecht, back to calcium, calcium ratios and balances, along with other nutrients. You know, really, really critical piece uh, that I found. You know, and I'm still, you know, learning and and hopefully doing a better job of of understanding, you know, the principles of of actually applying that um, those theories and those those known components about it on the farm. This is a look at what our rotation looks like. Um, a little confusing, but you know, everywhere where there's a cover crop, there's usually always rye in there. We did have either rye frosty with clover, rye and vetch, you know, as a uh, as a cash crop as well. As we've been expanding acres, there there likely won't be able to, in my opinion anyhow, be able to be quite We'll still have all these tools in our toolbox. We go to a row crop year. We can choose corn or sunflowers. Um, we'll still probably grow, uh, you know, some peas with rye, some vetch with rye from a seed production standpoint. But um, you know, simplifying the rotation a little bit, 
And this was one of the things that Gary and I have been working on um, to really try and push that system where we're actually, uh, you know, growing corn, uh, seeding rye after corn harvest, which rye is the only thing that we can do, right, uh, in, in November in Wisconsin or in the climates even of Vermont or the Northeast, the, the Minnesota is the places where rye has habitually been um, in this country, you know, a, a vital crop. And then frost seeding that clover and then, and then uh, going right back to corn again. Growing, you know, uh, increasing amounts, we've been getting to the point where you know, we're two or three tenths of a unit of applied end, you know, to grow a bushel of corn. So our nitrogen use efficiencies are increasing on the acres that I've been doing this on for the last uh, four or five years anyhow. But that obviously then produces a lot of rye, you know, so rye markets and, and elevating the demand for rye is really important. Rye seeding rates, these, this is stuff that actually came out of Maine, but, you know, really good data, you know, because a lot of times we talk about, you know, what how many pounds or how many bushels of cereal grains we're putting out. Um, many of you probably already know a lot of these calculations, but knowing what your seeds per pound is, knowing what your germ rate is, and then, and then getting a, an adequate amount of total live seeds out there and obviously increasing that, you know, the, the later you plant. But, um, you know, just, you know, not all seeds are alike. Some are much, much heavier, you know, um, or more dense actually, you know, because the, the seed size varies so significantly. So really sort of watching that, especially in my uh, seed growing work for Albert Lee, you know, a lot of those different, we grew seven different varieties last year and they all, they all had different, you know, uh, seeds per pound rates, you know, which, which all called for different seeding rates, you know, to get the achieved outcome. Um, this is some work that we, we grow a lot of 40, 10, we're still in dairy country. I know there's probably a fair amount of forage peas that might even be grown up in the Northeast. Um, I'd been told that you couldn't, you know, the, the, uh, the rye would, um, smother the peas. So when I was told that I couldn't do it, that made me want to do it. And we've been actually doing a fair amount of, uh, you know, pea seed production in conjunction with rye, you know, go in as early as we can in the spring, drill the peas you know, into the rye, harvest them together. And then uh, depending on whether the seed house uh, needs or wants the rye, we'll either separate it on the farm and just send them the peas, you know, or we'll send them that mixture and they can easily separate it at the, at the seed house. These are just some of the varieties that, that uh, we've grown. I think there's a few that could be added to that list. Um, we've not been, you know, particularly me personally, I haven't been particularly impressed or fond of the, the hybrid rye. They, they have to be planted about the same time as wheat would, right? In Wisconsin, that means, you know, the end of September, you know, first week of October, sort of the door starts to close, you know, in a system where I want to be able to take advantage of being able to come in behind another crop later in the year. Um, you know, those fall tillering, you know, hybrid rye don't really perform in that system. Um, but any of the other rice, you know, the open pollinated rice, you know, do do extremely well. Some of those seeds are grown like a rustic for, um, it's not a real fun crop to grow. It's tall, it wants to lay over, you know, it's a little difficult to harvest, but it, but it is a seed that those people that want to, you know, roll and crimp, you know, want to use. We've got, you know, some foundation seeds like Spooner, which was developed here in Wisconsin. You know, some of the, the, the local favorites that have been grown a fair amount of, you know, are Hazlitt and Danko. This is just some interesting uh, kind of fun data from, uh, and look at that, Vermont, right on the top of the list. Um, you know, this is 1908 rye production data. Um, and uh, you know, what's, what's even sort of more interesting is, you know, just where in the country, uh, this is the, the map that coincides with that chart. And you can just see, you know, the areas of the country that, that have the soils, either poorer soils or soils that are, that are inhospitable for other crops. Um, you know, these are regions of the country that rye is, is seeing a renaissance. And, uh, um, you know, I think that, that, you know, we were growing a lot of rye in this country. I think it was used as a lot of animal feed. You know, here's the, the same map in, in uh, 1919. Um, each one of those dots represents 25,000 bushels of rye. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, um, in 1930, 
the state of Minnesota, you know, grew 7.2 million acres of rye for grain. Um, and according to this data from the USDA in 89, it had diminished to 32,000. I think that number is coming back. You know, um, Mac Earhart from Albert Lee indicated that, you know, years ago they'd sell maybe 5,000 bushels of rye. And uh, in recent years, that's been like, a, you know, 150,000 bushels. So the, the demand for it is both cover crop seed and, you know, the resurgence of, of baking and, and using it as a, uh, a food ingredient. Uh, distillers are obviously seeing a resurgence of rye whiskey. And, you know, I think that there's even benefit if we begin to really look under the hood of some of the work that's been done in Europe, you know, to get hogs off of antibiotics, you know, they included rye and hog rations, you know, so I think that there's uh, tremendous, you know, animal feed opportunities, um, you know, that, that will provide additional benefits to the immune systems and digestive functions of those animals, you know, in addition to the acres in rye production uh, being beneficial for holding onto soil and reducing nutrient losses and those sorts of things. This is just rye by country, you know, obviously we're, we're if you look at that 270,000 metric tons, you know, the data that I looked at about, about um, about 10 or 11 million bushels of rye is grown in the United States and about 22 or 23 million bushels is used. So about half of the rye that's used in this country is imported, you know, so there's low hanging fruit there from a domestic production standpoint to get our homegrown rye, you know, in, into these market uh, streams. And, and uh, I think that's the first, you know, toehold for rye to regain, um, some prominence, you know, in the parts of the country where it really fits. Um, ergot, um, you know, so yeah, we go from growing it and selling it to uh, some of the big worries. And um, I say this cautiously, you know, we we really don't see a lot of ergot issues. And that, and you know, when I was preparing for this today, I started to really try and disassemble, you know, why, why that might be, because I grow a bunch of different varieties. So, you know, some varieties, you know, uh, promote the fact that they have ergot resistance. Um, we also, you know, don't plant headlands in our row crop years, and we also mow around all our fields. So, um, you know, we have 15 foot bat wing mower, there's always the edge factor, right, where yields aren't there and, and all the rest of it. So why, you know, put the seed there, put the fertilizer there to get a marginal crop and you know create a, a a door that's open for for weeds and other things to sort of become invasive on those field edges um you know the other thing about ergot is that there's a lot of hosts right so it, uh, you know mowing all those grasses on the field edge and preventing those grasses that could be a host for ergot you know uh if they go to seed um you know i think is a is a, a preventative measure you know that that just from a cult uh you know uh, our cultural practices, you know, may have been a benefit. The other thing is that a lot of research, and I have a couple of pieces in here, but you know, the the no offense against the plant breeders, but when we're breeding for stem height or head or you know protein or other things, much to uh, Jack Schultz's work at Ohio relative to some of the breeding on corn that that inadvertently you know um, bred out some of the ability to produce. Um, you know, some phenols and some, some, some other compounds that are insect and disease triggering signals, you know, we may have, if we can, if we can take a chromosome from wheat and breed it in, or rye and breed it into wheat uh, to increase its ability to uh, attain copper from copper deficient soils, I think this was um, you know, and, you know, I can get this cut, the, the actual paper to anybody that would like to look at it. it's pretty nice read, but, you know, they were able to see on copper deficient soils, if they put this rye chromosome, uh, you know, into their wheat breeding, that they could increase, you know, yields uh, on those, um, on those copper deficient soils that, that then leads you to the fact that what is the copper thing and back to our fields, you know, we manage uh, very aggressively the correction um, of both macro and micronutrients. So, you know, we get micronutrients over a period of time. It doesn't happen quickly, but we get micronutrients to the point where we're, where by NLP guidelines, we're not allowed to use micronutrients in our fertilizers anymore. 
Um, and that, you know, this study was done, you know, published in 91 and re referenced studies that go back 20 years earlier than that. And, you know, specifically calls out, um, you know, copper as a micronutrient that, that um, was, was critical in, in, the, in the reduction or prevention of the incidence of ergot. Um, you know, so I know when, after the last talk, I talked to Todd and I, I, I know you're on the call today, Todd, I think I'd still love to take a look at what your soil test looks like, because I think that for us as small grains growers, specifically in the rye world where ergot is really a problem, uh, can be a problem, um, especially if we're trying to get back into fields and grow rye again, uh, you know, in a, in a pretty tight rotation, um, you know, I think there's opportunity for the scientists on the call and the researchers on the call to look at some of this, uh, relearn what's out there, you know, and potentially replicate, you know, some of this micronutrient work. And, and I think that, you know, through either resistance or tolerance um, enhancements, you know, by micronutrients, you know, we might be able to, to uh, you know, unlock, you know, the genie of the bottle, you know, when it, when it comes to that and combine that with plant breeding and other good cultural practices. Um, but, you know, we really very, very seldom, and I, I've even seen seed that, I, that I've gotten in to plant, um, you know, from, from other seed growers, you know, that has a small amount of ergot in it, um, you know, and, and um, you know, we, we've just not seen it, uh, it show up in the fields to any, any significant amount. Um, and that's on you know older fields that are more certified organic, and we we don't even really try and do too much, um, you know, with a field until we get some of these soil soil health and soil corrective work done. So just a couple quick pictures, you know, this is uh, rye just this spring, you know, frost seeding which we did just a couple of weeks ago. Um, this year, you know, I'm, I brought in some clover from as far north as I could. It's uh, about 30 miles from the Northwest Tor Territories, about 2000 miles north of here. So it should be a nice winter hardy uh, mammoth red clover, but we've also used the uh, four-way mixes, you know, of, of other varieties of clover, but, but ultimately doing that, you know, uh, to try and get as much of our on-farm grown nitrogen. Um, and in a year like this, you know, we have uh, avian flu in Wisconsin. So my poultry litter supplier, you know, is, is anticipating having to uh, you know, lock his farm down here pretty soon and not allow our trucks on to pick up litter this year. So um, you know, it, it becomes critically important to decouple from those markets you know, uh, and at least you know, grow a, um, a fair amount of our own nitrogen. Um, this is the peas in the, in the rye. That was last year's field. Um, that's what Ryan Clover looks like. We're not looking for soup. You know, we want to actually plant a little bit lighter. So we're not looking for killer yields, you know, 50 bushel yields, but we want to have enough openness in the canopy of that rye, you know, that we get a good clover establishment. Harvest, you can see the clover languishing underneath there, ready to spring out. Um, a lot of rye straw. You know, um, a lot of clover, you know, come the following spring in that, you know, that all gets turned in uh, with a speed disc, very shallow, you know, two and a half, three inches deep. And, um, you know, and that's our nitrogen, as well as other nutrients and soil building, carbon, you know, et cetera, you know, living root in the soil, you know, all those things that we hear about all the time. So that, you know, really from a system of going into sunflowers or corn, after that, you know, that's the, that's the majority of, of our fertility. I don't know if I went through that too fast or too slow, or if you could see it all, but I know we wanted to try and get to some questions. And that's really where I enjoy these opportunities the most is to really be able to get a conversation going instead of just me being a uh, talking head and going through a bunch of pictures. <laughs> Well, great. Thanks, Sandy. That was that was great. I know I have a bunch of questions. I'm sure other people do too. And um, <clears throat> one quick question: Can you can you tell us a little bit about rye revival? I see that, and I've heard about it a little bit. I'm just curious. Yeah. So um, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> uh, myself and a 
um, Rita Hinden, a, a PhD um, out of uh, Princeton, it's where she, you know, um, epidemiologist, and you know, just had cross paths about, you know, her really looking at rye from a food, rye bread, rye health, you know, and and uh, Eastern European cultures that are still maintaining that as a significant portion of their diet. So we started a, a 501c3 nonprofit and, you know, are really just trying to collect as many people around the country, around the world. We're actually working with some people in Latvia and Poland, which right now has been a bit disrupted, unfortunately, because of the crisis in Ukraine. But, but really before a lot of the information about rye uh, growing it, uh, what what types of varieties, you know, what's best for baking, what qualities and those sorts of things, really just trying to create a network of people to ensure that, um, you know, anything that might be on the verge of being lost from the standpoint of knowledge transfer is protected and, and um, um, accessible, you know, uh, uh, to anyone, uh, as well as, you know, really trying to work to elevate these markets. Um, because as farmers, you know, I, I can love rye, uh, as much as the next farmer, but if I can't sell it, you know, it becomes a real challenge to to grow it, right? So, um, understanding that that there's going to need to be this relationship between um, you know rye growing and the knowledge around it, its benefits ecologically, animal, you know, plant and plant uh, human health, but but also um, you know, just really need. So, yeah, I mean, my goal would be that, you know, like by 2030, 10% uh, of everything that's got, you know, corn in it from a tortilla chip to a hamburger, to a cheeseburger, to bacon, cheeseburger, whatever it is, is going to have rye in it. Right. And, you know, that would translate to um, millions of acres, you know, that is certainly in the living where we do in the, the upper Mississippi watershed, you know, you know, I think that uh, if you just look at those types of markets and if we can connect with CPG manufacturers, you know, both the, the environmentally responsible ones like Patagonia Provisions and Cliff Bar and those, but also some of the bigger players that might not be as um, right now, anyhow, as open to that. You know, we, we in, in the Northeast, I'm sure there's, there's uh, groundwater and uh, surface water issues just like there there are here in the Midwest and and rye is a valuable tool if we can get enough of it grown rye will will be a valuable tool to to not only uh, reduce but but potentially reverse you know some of those those things thank you I I've been curious um, and hearing from various folks that have been working with you and and rye revival, and I mentioned, I think before everybody got on the call that June Russell, who now works for Glenwood Farms in New York, she used to be with Green Markets, um, and is now with Glenwood Farms. And June and I were just awarded a SARE grant to really draw more focus on adding value to rye. So, you know, in Vermont, we have really excellent adoption of rye as a cover crop in corn systems and as you might imagine that rye gets terminated right off here in the spring and you know part of our goal is to bring more rye um, to harvest <laughs> and right. we feel and you know and then what and where does it go and and so really trying to add some value to the rye that hopefully will add value to the farm in more ways than one so our project is is really going to be focused on many of the things that you were talking about. So very excited about that. Yeah, and being able, um, being able to plant it after corn harvest, certainly conventional or an organic system, being able to off some set some of those inputs, you know, and and right now everybody's thinking about it because fertilizer is you know three four times um, what it used to be if you can even get it, yeah. and those are those are good points, but. But I, I've seen these cycles come and go enough times now to know that that uh, a lot of farms will struggle through these hard times of obtaining or paying for fertilizer, and prices will come back down, and they'll be right back to doing what what they're doing. They were doing, yep. <laughs> really, really looking at it from you know growing your own nutrients, you know, uh, developing those markets, and beginning to look at a. One of our goals at Rye Revival is to really get. 
uh, a, the proper team together and obviously the funding to do some life cycle analysis work so that, you know, all of these ancillary components, right? When, when a farmer's growing rye after corn or putting rye into their system, you know, from the standpoint of capturing nutrients and reducing nutrient losses and, and then at opportunities to grow some of their own nutrients so that they're not buying or applying them. You know, there's, there's carbon offsets, carbon insets, you know, water uh, and air cleaning capabilities and all those things right now, you know, um, don't, don't necessarily get monetized, you know, yeah. um, and uh, so anyhow, those, those, those are really where a lot of the, you know, aside from the fact that even if it's not hundred percent rye bread, um, you know, if it's just included in rye baked goods or, or those sorts of things, it has, um, you know, I think it has human health benefits that are, that are, that are, were known. It's, you know, you, you, I don't know if anybody knows about the Gerson clinic, but you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been to Mexico to get treatment for cancer that they can't get in this country. The Gerson clinic is one of the places that does it. And the only bread you eat when you're at the Gerson clinic is rye bread. I don't, we've tried to reach out to them as rye revival and find out why that is, you know, yeah. uh, what is it about the glycemic index or the other components of rye bread that, um, makes it so important in their treatment of patients and the diet of same, but there, there's gotta be something there, you know, so unlocking all those things, having conversations like this, planting seeds, you know, with everybody so that, you know, as a, as a, a collective, you know, we can, we can begin to either look back at where that research is and, and uh, refine it, you know, or, or, um, maybe have to do some of it again, right? You know, to, yeah. to really get it back to where it needs to be. Yeah, well, these are all interesting. A lot, I'm taking a lot of notes. We do have a couple of questions uh, from the audience too. So Richard, I don't know, we have a small enough group if you wanna unmute yourself, that'd be great. I'm sure Sandy would appreciate that too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was just wondering how to, um, what's the best way to get calcium in, into your soil because that's a big problem of mine is with uh, uh, is just weed um, uh, you know getting rid of weed suppression is a big thing for I grow a lot of small um, uh, wheat uh, plots for uh, uh, program for the main grain alliance and and weeds is just the killer. Yeah, if you're ever going to have a presentation and you want a standing room only audience at an organic farming show, is you talk about weed management because it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the number one thing. Um, and you know, obviously, you know, uh, there's tools for it, right? You know, we can take steel to the field and and manage them to some degree, but preventing them in the first place is is that is that calcium piece. I don't know what the calcium sources are in Maine from the standpoint of of you know uh, what what mined calcium sources are available locally. Here in Wisconsin, most of our soils are very high in magnesium. You know, we were glaciated soils, so there's a lot of dolomitic lime in the parent material of the soils here. So, you know, really carefully not using the less expensive locally mined calciums, implying only high calcium, you know, lime, so that we're not continuing to increase the magnesium level at the same time that we're increasing the calcium level. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work out there that, you know, once we get calcium to magnesium ratios of five or six to one, you know, soils flocculate entirely differently. That field I showed you of corn, I would say half of the reason why that weed management was so much more efficient once we got calcium corrected was because of the flocculation of the soil. You saw where the water wasn't draining in a field of the identical soils across, across the road. So when I have weeds that nature has given them uh, the tools to uh, trigger germination in tight, compacted, waterlogged soils, they'll, they won't germinate. They just, they, their job is not needed right now. So they'll stay dormant. You know, a foxtail seed can stay dormant in the soil for like 50 or 60 years. You know, I've got fields that, that have been sprayed with chemicals for 30 plus years, didn't have a weed on them for all those years of no-till conventional production. And a lot of times we'll, we'll let them, we don't leave them go fallow, but we'll leave a, a fall or a spring fallow 
just to get a fingerprint of kind of what it is that we're up against. Because as soon as you take away the chemistry, you know, the rescue chemistry, um, you know, you'll see right away, you know, what your weeds are. But, uh, you know, I would, you know, depending on where your magnesium levels are um, and what the locally available or as close available sources of, of, a, of a mine product would be, sulfur levels are also pretty critical, especially if you're growing small grains, you know, the, the protein synthesis, you know, and the function that's supported to produce proteins in plants is supported by sulfurs, right? Um, so, the, you know, you may be able to find a gypsum product, right? You know, that would bring both calcium and sulfur to those soils, you know, which, which would have compounding benefit, um, you know, to get those calcium levels up. But, but ultimately, you know, pretty much around the country, around the world, you know, what you're looking for as far as a base saturation of calcium on a soil test is about 70 or 75%. And once you get to that point, you know, you'll see, I've, I've seen it everywhere, you know, you'll, you'll see these dynamic changes from soil aggregation and, you know, the flocculation of soil, air, air and water pore space changes, um, as well as some of these more unknown components from the standpoint of some weeds, that if that calcium is at a high enough availability, you know, 150 parts per million in the water saturation, you know, like if you took a pre-nitrogen side dress test, right, which is a water soluble extract test, and just simply paid them another three bucks to put calcium on it. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of, again, old, old research, but um, like 150 parts per million of water soluble calcium and, and it, and I get it to shut foxtail off. I mean, it just doesn't germinate. Yeah, and I've heard about uh, using liquid calcium. I was read some stuff about that, and people just kind of poo-poo the whole idea that it just doesn't even, uh, it, unless it's got other stuff to react with in the soil, it's just useless. Do you have anything to say about kind of liquid yeah, calcium? Yeah, I mean, some liquid calciums, I mean, some of the old timers even used to use skim milk, right? Um, you know, and spread it on fields. So, you know, high in calcium. I think that you know, you need, you need biologically active and properly biologically functioning soils, you know, so it's a more of a system approach. I, I don't know as though, you know, just saying that soluble, applying a soluble calcium to a soil, depending upon the soil type and condition, it, it might just get tied right back up again, right? And not, not be plant available. So, you know, having that, having the biological function being that, that pillar being simultaneously uprighted and, and potentially solidified along with calcium sources that, that either are or will be uh, soluble and plant available. I mean, it's, it's really sort of a stair-step approach to that. Great. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you want to unmute. Sure. <clears throat> I'll even show my face. <laughs> so... <laughs> I've heard about planting like two varieties of variety together just to increase pollination. I, I don't know of anyone that's ever tried that. I'm just curious if, if uh, you know, you've done that. I'm, I'm always a little hesitant to talk about that because the research that I've looked at is called evolutionary plant breeding, right? You take open pollinated varieties of corn or rye in this particular conversation. Um, but yes, it, you know, it's been Bill Davison from the Savannah Institute. Um, and I think his rye variety, his composite rye is available through the experimental farm network. Uh, you know, but that was a multitude of varieties, you know, half a dozen or more open pollinated that were planted together and then, um, you know, outcrossed over a period of a couple of years until they became a stable uh, variety. And I think that there's some, there's some coolness to that, right? Especially if you're looking at a small market, you want to try and create a regionally specific or, you know, sort of a terroir aspect to a grain rye in this conversation that you're growing that might go to a baker or distiller. You know, we have, with Bill Davidson's help, you know, I do have 10 acres of a composite rye that's that's out there right now. And uh, fortunately, I have the jars of the five varieties here, but a Bruzy, Donko, uh, Hazlitt, Ryman, and Spooner were all planted at equal amounts into this into the same field. We'll see what happens there from the standpoint of of, of what happens there. I think uh, 
could be a disaster, you know, could be, you know, all, you know, all sorts of problems. When we go back to the ergot conversation, obviously the longer you have flowering going on, right. And you don't have, a, you know, an even, um, uh, even, across, even flowering, even maturing across the field, which you're going to have uneven with a multitude of varieties, you know, there might be higher incidence of those types of disease pressures, but, um, yeah, I think that I think that uh, you know there's there's two paths, right? Obviously, when I grow for a seed company, I have isolation. I you know I have to stay a couple of miles from away from another rye field, you know, and make sure that we don't get that cross pollination to ensure that we're um, you know maintaining the integrity of the seed. But if you were to go into an area, um, to your point, you know, of, of deliberately um, you know crossing those open pollinated varieties, I think depending on what varieties you choose and what outcomes you're looking for. Um, you know, there might be some milling or distilling characteristics that could be teased out in that process that would be your own, that would be your own region or maybe even your own farm um, if, if you could be successful at that. But I, I have not done it to the point of success. I'm, I'm only just now experimenting with it. So another question I have is swathing. If anyone up there in Wisconsin does swathing for small grains, around here it's uh, we have one person in my region that does a, an organic farm. But when I mention it to farmers, it's like, you know, I'm from Mars. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we have two swathers, you know, um, both pull type and self propelled. Because some years, you know, depending on the crops we're growing, you know, we're doing a lot of swathing. Um, the swathing for us, you know, sometimes if they're if it's a combination crop like rye and vetch grown together, you know, rye and peas grown together, we have to swath it, you know, because of the the varying maturities and the green vines of the legume that's 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 co-planted with the rye. Other times, you know, we'll swath because we just don't have the bin space, right? So, you know, we've got other varieties. We're moving through with the seed house. We only have so many bins with air floors and conditioning capabilities. So we'll swath just so that it sweats in the field. So I don't have that big rush to get it in, in a bin and get some air on it, you know, to avoid it, you know, let it sweat in, the, in a windrow out in the field. But yeah, we, um, we swath quite a bit and there's still plenty of people that look at us driving down the road and don't know what we're doing. Like, what is that thing that you're either driving or dragging behind you? But, but yeah, swathing, um, even in a year, some of these, some of these fields, you know, I, I talk about calcium and good weed management, and I obviously show all the pretty pictures. I probably should have put some of the disasters in there that that have a lot of weeds in the field because those happen too, um, you know. So you know, being able to to swath, you know, to manage that, you know, so that we can run it through a combine, you know, is beneficial too. But yeah, I like I like swathing, and I and I feel that it just like you know we have two or three different cultivators depending upon soil conditions, crop crop type you know, and, and you know, weather related stuff, you know, I think that when it comes to harvest, it's good to have some additional tools in the toolbox too. So I do have another question if there's time. For it, Aaron. It's, uh, and of course it's back to calcium. Um, so is lime not an effective calcium source to get available calcium? And I mean, what, what do we have to do to get our calcium available in the soil? Yeah, well, that's that's a question probably um, that takes a bit to answer. But I think you know pH. I think your guys' pHs are typically a bit your more acidic soils right. where you are in the Northeast. So yeah. calcium availability is a little easier, you know, than on the calcareous soils that we're in here. Um, you know, where we already have, you know, a fair amount of gravel ground up you know from the glaciers um and and neutral or slightly even higher than neutral phs so in an acidic soil i think it's a little bit i shouldn't say easier but it, you know you're going to have chemistry you know in your favor um from the standpoint of solubilizing calcium you want biology there as well in our situation you know we're we're more reliant on on biology you know to 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 solubilize and make that calcium plant available. Um, and we can do that by, you know, by getting soil health, you know, back to where it needs to be supporting, you know, robust fungal communities, which are, you know, the beneficial soil fungi produce uh, exudates, you know, of like a one or two pH, right? They, that's how they 
that's how they function in the soil. So, um, you know, they're extremely helpful from the standpoint of solubilizing, you know, some of those rock minerals. Great, thank you. I think um, we have a few more minutes and Todd, you were, you wanna unmute? Thank you, Heather, Sandy, thank you. This is great. Good. Um, I've been walking in the fields of rye recently. We only have about 4% snow cover now. And I'm wondering, could we frost seed the mammoth red clover now and or planting with the rye in September? And where can we get it? Yeah, I mean, frost seeding versus planting with, I think is really, you know, the route to go. Um, I think planting uh, clover that late, you might have some risk that either either good germination or overwintering, you know. Um, so a more sure way of doing it is the spring frost seeding. Okay. I, if you if you get the nights where the ground still tightens up, you know, and uh, you can walk on it without getting your boots muddy, you know, and the sun comes up, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, you can't do that get out there early and, and frost seed, you know. Um, but, you know, I think that Albert Lee has some great clover blends for, for that mix. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's probably, you know, local seed purveyors that would have clovers as well. Um, yeah. the, the, I'm divided on whether the diversity, you know, like the clover that was in that slide that I had earlier that had four different varieties of clover, I think there's benefit to that, right? You know, having, you know, more diversity in even, even an interseeding crop like that. Um, but we'd seen some open winters here in Wisconsin the last few years, and that's really been sometimes a challenge. You know, after we get the clover established, after the rye is off, we want to make sure that that's going to survive that winter and be, be fixing nitrogen for us before the next row crop. Um, so the, my search on the mammoth red was, was really just through uh, a rye grower friend in, in Illinois that, that knows this guy that farms in one of the most inhospitable places I can even imagine. Um, he, he, he was driving through here and dropped my clover off. Okay. I only did 1,200 pounds of it this year, but uh, it took him a week to drive from his home in Canada to, wow. you know, it was almost a 3,000 mile drive, you know, it's practically straight north of here, you know, and uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that his mammoth red is going to be a really good overwintering uh, mammoth red clover, but nice. farm grown and farm cleaned, um, you know, and, uh, you know, runs a couple thousand certified organic acres. So it's, uh, it's grown on an organic farm, but, uh, but yeah, it, frost seeding is great, you know, and uh, we go out and just broadcast it. You know, we have a three point spreader on a tractor, um, 10, 12 miles an hour, 35 feet wide. You know, you can get a couple hundred acres done, you know, before the fields start to get too greasy. Thank you very much. I'll send you soil samples. All right. Yeah, I really? want to learn something. I think okay. we, yeah. Really great to share this. We're appreciative. Thanks, Todd. Uh, to um, Robert. You have a question. Maybe we'll wrap up with that one about combining procedures. Yeah, I just wondered what your uh, your cleanup procedures for you know your seed lots, your grown lot of uh, certified seed. There, what do you what do you do for clean out between your uh, a lot of organic farmers have a big challenge uh, cleaning combines and grain cleaners don't don't. Uh, necessarily work unless you're uh commercial right yeah so we um you know we have a service truck with an air compressor on it and uh a couple of of uh, milwaukee um you know portable uh shop backs you know they're just like a little suitcase and we'll spend as much time as is necessary to get every kernel uh, out of the combine, you know, kernel clean. And then we'll go into a field, we'll harvest um, and then purge, you know, anywhere between 50 and 75 bushels 
typically, you know, just keep a gravity wagon with us, you know, and, and um, I sell that to the local feed mill for chicken feed, you know, and um, that way between a really thorough cleaning job, you know, and, uh, and the purge, you know, to get any, you know, any grain that's hidden that we can't get, you know, that's in auger bays or, or parts of the combine that blowing and vacuuming just don't do a good job. Appreciate you, uh, your presentation back in Nofa land there back in January. Uh, oh, great. Todd, you and uh, Heather, you folks all, uh, all rock when it comes to this type of work. I appreciate it. Thanks, Robert. Well, great. I, if there are any other questions, um, please get them in the chat. Otherwise, we're gonna probably call it quits for today. I know everybody's busy and um, maybe even sugaring <laughs> some folks. And uh, yeah, I bet. Uh, Todd, you said uh, the snow is gone up. It's far. down to about 4% coverage. Um, we're losing it every day. It's almost gone. Nice. Nothing like Vermont maple syrup, man. Yeah. We're about yeah. done with syrup in New York. It's about over. I know. I, I don't. I haven't heard much. I don't know, Todd, if you have a sugaring report. Seems better than last year is what I keep hearing. Yeah. I hear we're ahead of last year and we're hopeful for the balance of the time. It's happening around Greensboro now. Oh, great. All right, well, Catherine put in information for the next webinars. We have one this coming week um, on drying and storage. So I know I'm excited to hear more about that. And, uh, and then some webinars on dry beans and then the anatomy of wheat flour. Again, all coming in the next few weeks. And maybe we'll be planting grain. I don't know. And at least down here in the valley, Todd, <laughs> by uh, mid-April. We'll see. That's great. Great. Well, I Todd, guess what, with when that, you say a oh. copy, did you want a copy of the of the slides I had or just the recording? Everything. A hundred percent. It was just so wonderful. Oh, it was. Okay, great. Yeah, I can get a um I can I can make that PowerPoint into a PDF and get that to Heather. And then yeah. she can share it. That'll have, share my it. That'll have my contact information in it as well. If anybody's got any further questions. Excellent. Thank and um, we do post the recordings if we have permission. And um, that way people can rewatch them as well, which is really nice. So, all right. Well, everyone, have a wonderful rest of the day. And hopefully we'll see you on Thursday for our, our next webinar. Really Thank nice you. to meet everybody. Thank you for your time, Dave. Thanks, Sandy. All right. Bye. Yep.